keeping thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen. All right. 256. 256 in your red hymn books, please. 256. Good to be saved. Good to be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's why all's well with your soul, amen? Yeah, yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. Lift him up. Lift him up. Give him the glory. Yeah, glory because he deserves the glory. Yeah, yeah. Amen. All right. <coughs> when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well. Oh! 
It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man. All right, 511, and please stand. If you'll please stand, 511, 511, amen. We're going to see Jesus face to face. And trust me, when you see him face to face in heaven, it's going to be a lot more louder than that. <laughs> it's going to be a lot more louder than that when they give him the glory. <clears throat> oh, let it be today, Lord. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, to die for me. Face to face I shall behold him afar beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Only faintly now I see him with the darkling veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. I shall behold him afar beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by, one rejoicing in his presence when our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened, and the dark things shall be plain. Face to face I shall behold him afar beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Face to face, a blissful moment, face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who loved me so, face to face I shall behold him afar beyond the starry sky. Let's start off with the word of prayer. Let's start off with the word of prayer. Brother Jack, will you open up the service with the word of prayer, please? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, come to you, Lord, at this moment to give you thanks, Lord, for just the breath of life that you give us. Hey. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship. Lord, may we not ever forsake you. Amen. Amen. Ask dear Father uh, that you forgive us, Lord, for our unrighteousness, our Amen, brother. We ask that you be a guiding, uh, guiding Holy Spirit in our life, Lord, uh, leading us to the things that we uh, see in your book, Lord, and, and know yeah, amen, brother. Amen. here, Lord, through the preaching, Lord, that preaching that we hear today, Lord, may that preaching be that preaching we need to hear this hour, yeah. Lord. Amen. Amen. And we ask Heavenly Father, Lord, that you. Watch over those who are not able to make it. Um, may you get those that are on their way here, Lord. Make them get here safely. Amen. Ask, Father, that these things are what Jesus Christ we ask. Amen. 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 All right. If you may be seated, you may be seated. All right. Uh, white hymnals, please. Page 40. White hymnals, please. Page 40.
Uh, I might be a little paranoid, but if our, uh, did our tech man disable the chat and see if the sound was echoing at the live stream? Yeah, so I hope that was the case, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right then, page, page 40 in the white hymnal. Oh, come on. Amen. forward and give the announcements for us. I think I was dwelling in Beulah Land a little bit, so I lost yeah. track of the verses. Hey, 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 you just wanted to sing more, yeah? <laughs> okay. Get to see all of your brother another week. Oh man, full house today. Praise the Lord. Let's see. Oh goodness. Sorry, I have a bunch of papers that I have a lot of things on that I have to, <laughs> to say. Let me first... Um, Pass out the volunteer sheets for December. Um, if you guys can commit, please, when you put your name on here, please commit. I would love for you guys to do that. Um, if you can come, Lord bless you. If you can't, Lord willing, you will be able to come soon. No pressure. Um, but if you do write your name, please show up. We are counting on you if you do write your name. Um, so our, I'm going to mention the blowout, Bible Believers blowout first because it's very important. We have a revival meeting basically three revival meetings from December 14th to the 16th, and the schedule is as follows. I don't have the detailed list um, of breakdown, but I do have the times where it will be held. If you need the flyer, tell me your pastor. I will email you the flyer. We have them. Um, so I will email you, and you can get the exact schedule if you want. We have a whole breakdown of activities and everything. Um, December 14th, it's going to be from 6 to 10 p.m., uh, December 15th, it's going to be 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. It's going to be like 12 and a half hours, praise God. Um, the location for Friday and Saturday will be at San Jose. It's 467 North White Road in San Jose. That's only for the 14th and the 15th. On the 16th, we're back here, except we start a little bit earlier at 9 a.m. and it's going to go until 4 p.m. And it's going to be the same address, 1375 Lafayette Street. But if you can't get here using that address, Try plugging in 8.30 to Google Maps, or 8.30 Lewis Street to Google Maps, because I couldn't find my way without that. Um, for, oh yeah, so for, for the revival meetings, those of you who are sure you're going to be able to make it from December 14th to 16th, please go tell Brother Rob your t-shirt size. We're going to get you a t-shirt. It's going to be awesome. We have awesome logo and everything. Um, Next week, we're going to have Sunday street preaching at 10 a.m. We're going to meet here. If you have food that you brought for the potluck, we're going to store it in the fridge, and then we're going to go on and go preach on the street. Uh, Wednesday night, discipleship will be at 7 p.m., and Bible study will be followed by that at 8 p.m. Um, for kitchen, me and Robert are going to do it today. Um, for whoever is doing the nursery, I pray that you, will, you are here. If you're not, um, it doesn't seem like we have any little ones here today, so that's not... That's not a too big of an issue today, praise God. Um, we have a, our memory verse is starting this week is going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Oh, we all know, this is a good one. If you don't know this one, I promise you this, these, this book will change your life because even if you don't know a whole lot about the Bible, you read this, you'll know who it's talking about. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 2 is what we're going to memorize for this week. Yeah. Next week, we're going to probably memorize the next two verses. We're going to do the entire chapter. This is going to be good. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 to 2. And just as a side note, I heard that there was uh, some Jewish people actually denying one of these verses in the book because it's such a strong proof that Jesus Christ wow. is indeed the Messiah. Uh, I believe that's verse 5, but we're going to get to that later. Don't get too excited now. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 2. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when, he, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. If you didn't know, this entire book is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. And, we, and from this verse, we know that he wasn't, he wasn't like strikingly beautiful like you see in those pictures that people, you know, draw in the media and all that. He was just an average Joe just like us in, in the flesh form of his flesh, but obviously he was God in the flesh. Don't forget that. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice 
voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. Amen. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever To... Oh, no problem, brother. Yeah, those are not my sermon notes, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Check so <laughs> check his pockets. Make sure that everything's safe. All right. So we're going to take up uh, the Lord's offering. We're going to have a brother Ralph, or Sean, come forward to take up the Lord's offering for us. Okay. Um, Lord, Heavenly Father, I just want to come to you, God, as truly a worthless piece of flesh, Lord, that deserves nothing but hell, Lord. That's good, brother. Just first and foremost, I want to pray, God, that you wash away my sins with your holy blood. Amen. I just want to pray, God, that the money that we tithe here today is just pray, God, that you bless this um, just for the missionaries and for the church, God, and just all for your glory. Um, amen. All this according to your will, the Lord Jesus Christ, name I pray, amen. 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 Good job, brother. Amen. chapter 2 and verse 12. I meant to preach this sermon for some time. I think some of you have heard this before, but it's been a while. But the Lord, he did lay it upon my heart to preach this sermon because I don't know if some of you know this, but we're going to soon have a blowout. In this blowout, you're going to see some things are a little different. Now, I never planned to do a blowout revival meeting uh, for a long time because I felt like that my members weren't ready yet. Now, some of you might say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Because it may not be your typical kind of church services you've been through in this area. We are a King James only, dispensational, not dead, Holy Spirit filled, shouting Bible-believing church. That's what we are. Now, I know that you're used to the dead atmosphere of different churches and the fancy lights and then people saying nice things about you. But in the revival meeting, it's going to be no holds barred. Yep. That's what it's yeah, going to be. It. So if you are dying for that kind of a church service where there's people who shout the victory, people who run the aisles, people who don't uh, filter when they preach, they just preach the whole That's counsel right. of God, yeah. Yeah. and where people have a love and a desire for, to serve God, then you will enjoy our blowout meeting. So uh, in this blowout meeting, what we're going to have is we're going to have altar calls. 
So some of you have seen that in our regular church services where people would come down here for it on the altar and that they would pray. Some of you might wonder, well, why do we do that? You know, is that because of tradition or etc.? So the Lord laid it upon my heart to preach a sermon about altar calls because I believe for a lot of people here, they don't understand the meaning and the importance behind it. Because when you look at the blowout meetings, what you're going to notice is this. You're going to see a lot of people people who don't attend our church but just visiting, a lot of them are going to be coming forward on the altar and praying. And I want you to uh, see and understand that and don't feel like you're being left out or being weirded out. So I'm going to preach you this sermon so as to give you a heads up about the importance of altar calls. And uh, when the preacher preaches unfiltered, don't let that scare you. Uh, when some people run around the room a bit, don't let that scare you either. It's because over here, it's going to be a no-holds-barred uh, blowout. That's why I haven't done this for many years, for many years. But uh, I'm excited that we can finally do this. And I hope that you'll find it a tremendous blessing rather than a burden. Because I know that my members here, when they attended the revival meetings, it was the best thing that they ever experienced. Yeah, amen. Amen. So that uh, only they themselves can say that, not me. So because I have a burden to bring it to all of you, that way you all can experience that joy that some of the members felt. Because I know it's a long drive to Southern California. That's where you guys experience the revival meetings because I don't set one up here. Yeah. But finally, I'm setting one up here for the first time because uh, I want to finally introduce it to all of you who have not enjoyed the experience with us. So I'm doing this for you. I hope you understand that. I hope you understand that I'm doing this for you to be a blessing, not as something new or strange. So I'm going to preach a sermon about altar calls. Uh, look at verse 13, please. Uh, verse 12, excuse me, verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth out his chamber and the bride out of her closet, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? And this passage, the prophet Joel is preaching an end-time event prophecy about the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, they received the prophecy that one day all of them will be gathered together. And when they all gather together, God, he wants a profession outwardly. That's the point of this whole sermon. An outward showing profession where they're sincere and they're repenting and they're getting right with God. And so he's calling and gathering everybody. And I can see how this applies to us today. Doctrinally, this is for Jews in the tribulation, but we can practically and devotionally apply it to ourselves where if the Jews can do that in the tribulation, why can't we do that for Jesus Christ? Amen. Why is it that we can't show and outwardly, outwardly show in the sight of other people where we repent and where we get right with God? Amen. Where we show, Lord, this is my light, uh, my life that I dedicate to you and I throw it on the altar. Today's sermon, I hope you'll understand the importance of altar calls, and I pray that the sermon will be a blessing to you rather than a burden. Today, my title is, What's the Big Deal About Altar Calls? Let's pray. God, my Father, uh, today I'm not in good shape. Uh, right now, there's a lot of stuffiness that's in my sinuses, so I'm not thinking straight. Uh, yesterday night, uh, we weren't able to sleep well because the neighbors are playing their loud music. So I'm not in my best shape, Lord. So I pray that you'll please help me to have a fixed and straight mind because this is a serious service 
where we're going to give a serious profession to you. I pray that you'll wash away my sins with your precious and most holy blood because Gene Kim is still nothing without Jesus Christ. And it's so strange, Lord, and kind of funny that for more, th for more than 10 years, I've been preaching your word, and every time I come up to the pulpit, I always get that fear of the Lord, that nervousness over my own ability, how, uh, how incapable I am without the capability of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I pray that you'll accept that, and I pray that you'll take full control and fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. Make today's preaching a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, my first point is consecration of the altar. Please look at verse 12. Verse 12. Please look at uh, verse 12 through 13. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So you'll notice right here that God, he demanded right here, I want you to dedicate, to consecrate yourself to me. Give up yourself to me. That's the reason why we have altar calls. It's an opportunity for you to surrender, to consecrate yourself to the Lord and say, here I am, Lord, use me. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, it actually says right here that, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So in the Apostle Paul's writings, he mentioned that Christians, they should consecrate. They should surrender. They should give themselves up to God. And what I would like to ask you is this, is that some people, they would think that the altar call is just a style that's for others, but it's not for me. It's a style that other people do it, but not for me. Or it's simply a tradition that churches do over and over again. Or it's just a routine where I just go down, briefly confess my sins, and that's it. No, you got to see it as an opportunity to visibly, to visibly, outwardly show to God, present yourself, that God, here's my body. I throw myself on the altar. This is my surrender to you. That's why people bow on the altar. To show a sign of God, this is all that I am. My humility, I'm nothing. I throw myself on the altar at your feet and say, God, use me. I give up my sin. I surrender my life. I give up my desire, my joy. Here I am. It is a sacred and serious opportunity that you should take and not just brush aside or rush through. This is not a routine, folks. Our church is not a routine. Amen. Our church is not a tradition. The reason why we do these things is because we do it for a reason. We do the altar calls so that it's giving you a chance. It's a chance and an opportunity where you say, God, visibly, outwardly, here I am. Oh, I could do that inside myself. Yeah, a lot of people do that inside themselves. But when you do it outwardly as well as inwardly, yeah, it's, a, it's a totally different kind of experience yeah, that you're going to notice. Because outwardly, you're showing it to others. You're showing it to God. You're being serious outwardly. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You see, the altar is not a place of bondage and forcing or pressure. The altar is a place of freedom where your burdens are cast down. Amen. That's what it is. Because the thing is, is that you're carrying that burden every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And that burden was developing so much more in your life where you are carrying that same struggles that you're struggling with, carrying the same thought problems, carrying the trials that you're going through, and whatever burden that's going on in your life, it's a chance where you say, God, this is my burden, and you come down on the altar, throw the burden down right there, and say, God, this is my burden that I cast at your feet. Will you please take my burden off of me? Amen. Lord, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And 
you might say, well, I don't understand that. Yeah, you don't because you did not experience it like the others who went on the altar. Did not you people, when you went on the altar, you felt like this is finally something off my shoulders that I can roll off. And then once I roll it off my shoulder and confess it and lay it at the feet of Jesus, I walk back my seat and I don't look back behind me. I don't look back at that thing anymore. I repented already. I covered it under the blood. I'm not looking back anymore. Amen. And when you see our blowout, you'll really understand that. Yeah. You'll really understand that feeling. You'll really understand that experience, that kind of situation that you dealt with. It's to just look back and uh, it's just to put it there and never look back behind you. Sometimes people leave some of the burdens on the altar. And then you know what you guys do? Some of you just carry some of that burden back with you when you go back to your seat. And that should never be the case. The altar is a place and an opportunity where you say, God, all and not some. All of it, Jesus Christ, and not some. It feels so free to leave it all on the altar and walk away, never looking back behind you, right? I, that, I'm not the old me anymore. I remember back then. That was before summer camp. That was before the KJV Jubilee. That was before that Sunday pastor preached. No longer, man. I'm, I'm going forward now, and I'm not looking back behind me. Did you guys remember that? Yeah. When was that experience that your life changed on, besides salvation? Wasn't it at the altar, right? Yeah, amen. It was at the altar, right, when everything changed for you? Some of you understand what I'm talking about if you've been there. You guys know that I'm talk what I'm talking about. It was at that experience, at some certain kind of special preaching or a revival yeah. meeting, when you went on the altar and then you said, I dedicate myself, and you guys changed a lot, didn't you? Yes, yeah, because why? Because it's a totally, knowledge is different from experience. Yeah, we know in our head, okay, God, I confess, I repent, get it. It's totally different from doing it in your head and doing it all outwardly. Amen. It's a totally different experience, you got to understand. My second point is verse 14. Verse 14, consequence of the altar. Consequence of the altar. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave, look at this, a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Man, notice the consequence of the altar. The consequence right here is that once you confess it to the Lord, now remember, the point of verse 12 through 17 is a outward public repentance and confession. Not just inwardly. Okay, God, uh, you know that I confess God right with you. No, God wants you to say it out loud in front of the whole world. That's what he's going to do at the judgment if you don't do it. <laughs> he's going to do that with every single person from the most holy That's Christian true, to the worst kind of atheist. He's going to make sure everyone does it outwardly. To bow the knee, profess Jesus is the Lord, and to confess the sin... And if you and you say, oh, I did it at my heart. No, no, no. God wants it out. Yeah. He wants it for the whole world to see so that people can see who gets the glory That's here. Good. And it's me, God says. But when you do that at verse 14, notice it says, leave a blessing. Notice there's a meat offering, a drink offering unto the Lord your God. That's the consequence. The consequence of the altar is after you do that public confession and public repentance, and there's a fruit. There's a That's blessing good, behind right. it. Amen. And there is that blessing behind it. Public confession is absolutely important. That's the reason why we do altar calls, you got to understand. It's because it's an opportunity to do a public confession. After all, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 through 33, it reads, Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. You've got to understand that Jesus Christ, in that passage, he takes confession very seriously, you'll notice. He takes confession very seriously where he says right here, I want you to confess me before men. I want you to do it in front of all the world to see. And if you won't do that, if you're going to deny me publicly... Oh, no, I accepted you. Yeah, individually, privately. No, God says, if you do deny me publicly, ignore it, neglect it publicly, then I'm going to ignore it and deny you as well. Now, obviously, concerning salvation, 
We're all saved and we're secured. He never deny us of our salvation. But he can sure deny you of your fellowship. Yeah. Have you read 1 John 1? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, in, you're a saved Christian, but you can get outside of fellowship. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think God tends to favor more and bless those who do things for him publicly or privately? That's the thought, see? Well, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Amen, you're right. If you do it all outwardly and nothing of the heart, that's nothing of you. Yep. But you know what God wants? He wants all of you, inward and outward. Amen. That's what he wants. Because remember, out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Uh, yeah. The sins come out because from the heart. You understand this. When you come on the altar, you get right with God. It shows also what's in your heart sometimes. Sure, it can be fake. Sure, people just do it like a machine. And when they do it, you're just wasting your time on the altar. And I just want you to go back to your seat and not even come to begin with. See, altar call is not a forceful method. It's a freedom. It's where your heart is in it. And then you do it outwardly to the Lord. Now, I want you to understand, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying right here, is that sometimes you got to ask yourself this. People ignore altar calls because of their love of privacy and shame of how they look in front of others. It's unnatural. It's not you. That's right. It's not you. It's not the comfortable you, how you're used to doing things. What God likes to see is getting you outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. He wants to see some, if you're willing to do something new, something different. But a lot of people, majority of people don't like doing that. We're all comfortable with what we want to believe in, how we always lived our life, our practice, our own walk with Jesus. And so says the atheists and the different religions and cults about they're comfortable with how they live their life. And they don't like something new all of a sudden. Critics, they try to resist altar calls because it's just a rush process of just showing confession rather than showing actual fruits. I've heard that from some people before. They would say that, well, you know, people, they just confess on the altar, and when they confess on the altar, they think that they're right with God, and they can go back home and do the same old sin, the same old habits. No, we firmly deny that. We believe this is that when you publicly confess to the Lord, you better show the fruit after that. You know, I'm very tired of hearing some Calvinists like Paul Washer and other people where they keep denying and pushing away altar calls because Calvinists, all they like is see uh, the Holy Spirit naturally working within, within and within, and nothing of you, nothing outward of you on your part. No, God, he wants you to do the action because the Holy Spirit is already working in your heart, yeah, but amen. you refuse to accept it yeah. and to outwardly work in it. Amen. That's the thing with the Calvinists. And I agree with them. I don't like a rush process of just showing confession rather than showing actual fruits. But don't you think God is pleased when you show both confession and the fruits? He loves confession. Don't you know that? God loves to hear confession. Where you profess that Jesus is the Lord. Where you say, I am wrong. Where you say, I surrender all. I give up. He loves to hear that from you. He loves to see that from you. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10 through 11, it says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, what if I'm mute and I can't say it? No, that, won't, that excuse won't work with Jesus Christ. He's going to give them a tongue to speak, right. the person who can't speak. And he'll make sure that person say it out loud, his sin, his life and profess I am wrong and profess Jesus is Lord. He's going to make the person say that. Critics, they dislike altar calls because they'll point out cases of people being rushed in the process and then they would prefer not coming down on the altar to begin with. They would prefer to see something out of your life instead. They would prefer to see, I would like to see a change in your life rather than just seeing you a change with the mouth. That's what they would try to critique, and that's what they would try to argue. But here's the thing is that, like I told you before, of course we deny that. But God, just because you're going to show the actual fruits, 
doesn't mean that God doesn't like to hear confession. He would sure love to hear your confession, not just your fruit. He wants you to say it. He wants you to say it to him and to show it to him. Because think about it. Aren't you going to do it in heaven anyway? If you're ashamed to kneel, kneel on the altar, aren't you going to kneel in the throne of heaven anyway? Aren't you going to bow the face in front of him if you're ashamed to bow the head over here? Amen. Well, I'm, I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed to uh, show it to the Lord where I walk down in front of so many people and then walk down in front of so many people and then confess it to the Lord. Amen. You're going to do it in front of billions in heaven yeah. and we're going to be the jury as well at the great white throne judgment. I mean, you're going to do it anyway. You're going to walk in front of everyone to see, and you're going to bow the knee, and you're going to say it, you're going to confess it that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's going to make you confess. God says that you're going to confess. At the book of Romans, chapter 14, you're going to have to give an account of yourself to God. And you can't just say, oh, God, you already know my heart, so I don't have to say it. No, that's not going to work with God. God's going to go, oh, yeah, I already know, but I want you to say it. Say what you did at Thanksgiving of November, what you did that day, and what sin you messed up in, and how you let me down, and how you did serve me, and how you didn't let me down. I want to hear every detail out of your mouth. He wants that out of you. You know why? It's not because he doesn't know. It's because you don't know. Sometimes we deceive ourselves. Already know, I already did it in the head. No, 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 no. When you actually do things outwardly, it's totally different, the feeling sometimes, and the thinking. And when you say it to the Lord, and then you realize, you know, I didn't see it that way. It's like, one, it's like for example, when you know the knowledge in the workplace, but when you're actually outwardly applying it in the job, it's totally different, isn't it? There's a total difference with inward and outward. It's such a blessed experience of leaving your seat, your comfortable seat of fleshy comfort, and throw off the load on the altar, fall on your face before a holy God, and that you pour out all your heart to him, and then you stand up refreshed and renewed. Yes, it's such a blessed experience. You're going to do that in heaven. You're going to do that in heaven. Shouldn't you do it down here on earth before? My third point, look at verse 15. Verse 15. Congregating of the altar. Congregating of the altar. Look at verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Now, you'll notice right here how God, he's congregating. He's gathering people together. And that's what God wants. Notice all the people. Notice that in verse 16, he's listing all kinds of different people. The elders, the children, the newborn, bridegroom and bride, and then et cetera, et cetera. Notice all different sorts of people that are congregating to give a public confession to God of their own account and to publicly confess their worship before him, publicly repent of their sins to him. I want you to think about that throughout past church history. And because of Christians throughout past church history that have done that, why can we not do that too? Why can we not do that too? I mean, there was one time Peter Cartwright. Peter Cartwright, he was preaching hellfire and brimstone, preaching repentance of their alcohol, their gambling, their life of sin. And you know what? In his altar calls, there were many wealthy women, wealthy, prestigious women who had no shame, and they didn't care about their accountability, their look, their reputation. They just went forward on the altar, and they just prayed, and they wept, and they repented and confessed their sins before God on the altar. They had no shame. They had no care of people. And I'm talking about women who are wealthy right here. And they did that before God on the altar. And there was a man who was demon-possessed or something, but he wanted to disrupt that altar call. He wanted to disrupt their public confession before God. So then he brought a string of frogs with him. But when he brought that string of frogs with him, brethren, when you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, especially on the altar, you notice that, right? You're being filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit when you're... When you're emptying yourself more of flesh, surrendering yourself more to God, and saying, God, just as I am without one plea, here's my sin, I repent, 
use me, I surrender myself to you, then God can make more room in you. And when one person does that on the altar and another person, another person, and when you got so many people doing that on the altar, there's something about it that's going to make your flesh uncomfortable. Amen. And that man who brought that string of frogs, his flesh felt very uncomfortable. He felt some kind of dreadful, hellish presence when he was about to let the frogs loose. And then he realized there's something serious going on here. And I got to, and you know what happened? The Lord spoke, dealt with his heart. He got under conviction from the preaching, from the altar call, from the people getting right with God, that he repented himself, went on the altar, and got right with Amen. God himself. That is the power of surrendering yourself on the altar before God, a public confession. There was another time where there was no room for so many people in one of D.L. Moody's preaching. And D.L. Moody, he preached a great revival and there were just too many people, so there was no room. So you know what D.L. Moody did? That did not stop him. He saw a horse carriage and then he went on top of the carriage and started preaching at them. He started to preach on top of the carriage. And what happened as well is that the choir, the choir had no room to sing, so they all stood on top of a roof of a shed, and that's where the choir started singing. And that, because there was just so many people, and the Lord mightily used in that meeting for his glory and honor, and there were 3,500 people who responded to the altar call that day. That's how the Lord mightily used it. Look at past history of fellow Christians before us, of how the Lord mightily used it with altar calls. There was another person named Billy Sunday. He was famous for what he called hit the sawdust trail because he would set up cheap meetings because they, he went all over the place and he had to set up real quick. So he would set up cheap meetings and then he would set up uh, sawdust on the aisles. And then people, they would just march through the sawdust down on the aisle, come down on the altar, repent to make a public profession and get right with the Lord. In fact, he did it so many times that it actually reached a total of, I don't know if this is true or not, but he, I wouldn't doubt it because he had hundreds of meetings and thousands upon thousands of people. It had about one and a half million attendees in total throughout his whole life of altar calls. Because he did it so many times. He went so many places. And when he did that, that included several people, such as four of the New York Yankee teammates, as well as home run Baker. They went down the altar, hit the sawdust trail, and got right with God. They did not care what people thought of them. They did not care what the media would thought of them. They had no shame, and they just went on the altar and said, just as I am, without one plea, they got right with God. You might say, man, how, why are there that many people? That's hard to believe. You know why you find that hard to believe? Because of Laodicea and apostasy, where we've gotten so cold right. that nobody, nobody would dare do that. Yep. That's how cold we've gotten spiritually. Back then, man, back then, before higher education strongly took a foothold, before those hippies came out, and before that CCM music started rocking really hard, before the, uh, people start to really switch to different Bibles, man, people just fell all apart today. But back then, man, those people had no shame. They got right with God. Marshall Craig, he had an altar call for university students. And you know what? In those universities, man, before secular education took more and more of a foothold, man, those universities, they still had preachers coming in. Didn't you know that Harvard had George Whitfield preach for them before? And Fanny Crosby spoke over there before? Didn't you know Princeton was founded by Jonathan Edwards? What happened? How are the mighty fall? In the universities, man, students would get down on the altar, repent and get right with God, not care about their education, their looks in the eyes of their peers. They went down on the altar, got right with God. And in fact, there was in fact even a cripple. And this poor man who was handicapped, a cripple, he would crawl. He would crawl on the altar. People had shame. Oh, you know, that person's handicapped. I understand if he doesn't come on the altar. No, he didn't care. He wanted to make a public profession and public confession. He did not care. And he would crawl on the altar. And as he crawled forward, he asked God if God had a place. When he went on the altar, he looked at the preacher crawling. And Craig looked down at him. And that cripple looked up at him. And you know what he said? He said this. God seems like has a place for all these athletes and campus leaders that I see in this university. 
Does he have room for a wreck like me? He didn't think, oh, yeah, 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 I'm not qualified and that's too much for me. No, no, no. He wanted to publicly confess. And he wanted to publicly confess, but he was wondering if he was worthy to do it. University folks. Mordecai Ham. Oh, excuse me. I forgot to say this. Craig, he looked down at that cripple, and you know what he told him? Son, God has just been waiting for a wreck like you. <laughs> what a blessing. Mordecai Ham, when he preached, he would jump from the altar, and there was this drunken gunman, and he said, I'm going to blow your brains out. You better shut up. But Mordecai Ham, at that altar call, he would jump off the altar, and then he would go down, marching down the aisle toward that drunken gunman, and that... And he was singing a hymn, Tell Mother I'll Be There, up at heaven. And as he kept singing that hymn, Tell Mother I'll Be There, Tell Mother I'll Be There, he went closer and closer to that gunman. And that drunken gunman, I mean, he was drunk. He could have pulled the trigger at any moment. But Ham had no fear, and he walked forward. And that, and that man, that drunk who was holding the gun, he kept saying, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot. But then, you know what happened? When he walked forward and he went face to face with that drunk, that drunk got the fear of the Lord on him, and he said, I repent. And that man threw away his dice, his gun, and his liquor bottle on the altar floor, repented and got right with God. Amen. Look at past history of how we took altar calls. How dare these Calvinists, how dare these so-called, so-called new IFB who are anti-Semites and teach that Christians will go through the tribulation. How dare these people make fun of altar calls criticize altar calls how dare they went past history how the Lord mightily used it and great revival meetings this is proof of Laodicea apostasy when you got so called righteous holier than thou Christians who think they know so much of the Bible crit criticize altar calls now you know we're in apostasy after that Amen. I remember Song Lee and this includes all different cultures too. Song Lee, he's the man who was responsible for translating the King James Bible to Korean. But I remember one time when he was at this church service and he was preaching and then me and a few folks went on the altar and then you know what Song Lee did when he looked at that? He rebuked at the people. <laughs> he rebuked at his Korean people and he said, what, so only these people are the ones with sins and you don't? Why don't you get right with God? And then several people started to come down on the altar after that. See, this altar call thing, you got to understand, is not for selected few. Yeah. And it's not like, oh, Koreans were too much for that, too. No, it's not a matter of culture, age, gender, situation, yeah. character. It's for all to give a public confession to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brian Del Grande, I remember when he would preach at those camp meetings. And, man, he would preach so hard. I mean, th this man is no holds barred preacher. All right, he is a no holds barred preacher. And this man, one time, he was preaching so hard, and he said, some of you are just super glued. Your butts are super glued on the seats. And we're like, whoa, whoa, like that. And then you know what happened is that there were some people who were actually contemplating suicide. But it was at his preaching that the Lord mightily used, and some of them were weeping on the altar. And some of the girls, they were just weeping on the altar, repenting and getting right with God. That's a blessed experience that you don't want to trade a million dollars for. I remember that uh, nearly an hour, me and the other fellow men, as well as Del Grande, we would pray on the altar for nearly an hour. I remember that one time experience before. Oh, to God, we would have something back close to the Great Awakening revivals. We're just too used to the time and the schedule and then how we do things. And this is not how we do things at Silicon Valley. This is not just me. No, we got to realize that, hey, we got to get out of our comfort zone now and start getting more serious for the Lord, like back then. I remember Dr. Ruckman when he was preaching, and he preached so hard against liquor. And he preached so hard against liquor that while he was on the altar, Dr. Rotman took a liquor bottle and he started screaming against liquor and he threw the liquor bottle across the aisle and it banged against the wall at the end right there. And then several drunkards went on the altar and they got right with God. And they repented of their drinking. And they got right with the Lord on the altar. You think that, uh, you think that what we do here is extreme? You don't know what extreme is, folks, back then. Right. You don't know what, how the Holy Spirit was moving back then. We're just so used to a fleshy, That's comfortable, right. traditional Great. setting. 
Dr. David Peacock, one time he was preaching about casting crowns at Jesus' feet, and members, what they would do is that some of them, they would get up from their seat, take off their shoes, and they would throw their shoes on the altar as if they were casting crowns at the feet of Jesus Christ. The altar throughout back then and even today, you see the experience, the power, and the blessing that you don't want to miss, for, miss out. I remember that Sam Gipp, he preached a sermon called One Chance. And that one chance was a powerful sermon that made people's hearts rush to the altar as if it was their last chance, their only chance to get things right with God. And I saw that altar call just flooded with people, having as if one chance to repent and get right with the Lord. And I heard that sermon before, so I was like, well, I already repented, so I don't have to do that. And then when I kind of peeked, I realized in my pew, everyone was gone. <laughs> I was the only one standing. But you see, that's the blessed experience of past history and today with Bible-believing churches. Why do we have to be different? That's right. I remember Pastor Brian Donovan, when he was preaching his sermon, there was this Filipino woman. He was preaching at the Philippines, and this one woman, she did not wait for the end of the sermon. She just ran in the middle of his preaching, down on the altar, wept and repented before the Lord. And then every time Pastor Donovan would mention about some sinner messing up in some sin, this Filipino woman would cry out loud, Yes, that's me, Jesus. You know that is me, Lord. I repent. No shame. No shame. Public confession. You know what? You know, uh, what happened? We're in 2018. That's what happened. That's right. You know what happened? We forgot Bible-believing churches. That's what happened. You know what happened? We've gotten cold. That's what happened. God mightily used altar calls from the past great awakenings and even today's Bible believing churches why should we stop now and act like a negative critic and say no 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 that's not how we do things how can we dare say that and prevent the mighty power of God from happening back then and now and then all of a sudden some so and so gets up and says no let's not do altar calls I don't believe in that that's not right my last point is confession of the altar Confession of the altar. Let's look at verse 17. Look at the last part of verse 17. This is the important thing I want to emphasize. Last part of verse 17. Where is their God? That's the point of everything. Where is their God? And that's what... God wants. He wants actually confession. You'll notice at verse 17, they're outwardly confessing to the Lord. Notice people say among the people, where is their God? Do you know why we do altar calls? Because people are asking, where is God? People ask, where is their God? But altar call is a time where you outwardly profess to the Lord, God is right here. It's a time where you show God outwardly moving and working and dealing and convicting people's lives. It's an outward chance. It's a chance that outwardly shows God is working in the room. Haven't you been to too many churches where the pastor preached a little ditty sermon and that was it and we all clap our hands and then we sing a little CCM, beat the drum beats, and we all go home and eat in a buffet. And don't you see, when you see that every time, don't you ask yourself, where is God? Don't you go... Man, God's not in this church. Where is God? Where is God? Where is God? Where is, has God been during the church services? Turn to Ezra chapter 9, please. Ezra chapter 9. And we'll read verse 5. Ezra chapter 9. And then we'll read verse 5. Notice the word of God says right here, then Ezra chapter 9 verse 5, Ezra is giving a confession in front of the whole nation. And as a matter of fact, the whole nation, they were encouraged to follow along. And you know what? The whole nation followed what Ezra did in his outward confession, and they were able to change, and the Lord mightily used them. You might say, wow, really? Yeah, look at verse 5, Ezra chapter 9 verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle... I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens. Now notice that Ezra did this publicly. 
outwardly so that people can see his repentance. When he did that, notice what happened at verse 15. He keeps on praying. On, uh, he keeps praying at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 he ends the prayer. When he ends that prayer at verse 15, look at the response at chapter 10, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had what? Confessed. See? Because it's outwardly shown. Weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. Notice that when he, the verse says when he confessed, this confession is described as what? Weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. We confess on the altar because why? We cast ourselves down to God. Sometimes we would even weep as well. But let's keep reading. There assembled unto him out of Israel a great, very great congregation of men and women and children for the people, what did they do? Wept very sore. You see what happened? What happened is because of one person who wept and repented and got right with God on the altar, other people were encouraged to do so as well. They wept out loud before the Lord. And you see, it is very encouraging to join your fellow brothers and fellow sisters in Christ to publicly declare your stance for Jesus Christ. It's encouraging for the pastor to maintain the stability of his preaching or to preach even better. You know, that's what altar call is. When a person goes down on the altar and gets right with God, it encourages another person to repent and get right with God. It makes the service more sincere and more real. It encourages a preacher that looks like my preaching is working on something. So he'll keep parking it right there. He'll preach. Uh, he'll keep preaching even harder and better. You see, that's what confession does. Because outwardly it shows to God, but see, it also shows to other. You're right, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, man can't judge you by the heart. They look at it outwardly. That's human beings. Human beings are like that. Turn to Acts chapter 19, please. Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. Notice right here, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks, also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus, notice right here, was magnified. Why? Why was God magnified? Look at verse 18. And many that believed came, and what? Confessed. And notice, and showed their deeds. Look how they did this outwardly. Verse 19. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. See that? This is in the sight of all the people. They repented and burned their sins before the Lord. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Some people say, well, I don't believe in keeping count at altar calls. Well, look at right here. They kept count of how much sin, how much the people threw it all down publicly before the Lord. I think it's a good thing that we do that. I don't believe in doing numbers to show off the church and think, oh, this is how many people got saved. This is how many people confessed and got right with God. So there's a great revival in our church. See, all of that is statistics. All that is statistics rather than from the heart. You don't know how many people from the heart actually meant it serious business with the Lord. So we condemn that as well. We don't believe in statistics where you show it off to people and think you're all spiritual because of numbers. That's not how it shows spiritually. The fruit, by their fruits ye shall know them. The fruit is what shows if you're spiritual or not. But that doesn't mean that you should go off the other end of the extreme and get rid of numbers as well, get rid of statistics. Haven't we, as a church, through our bulletin with the numbers and statistics, didn't it encourage us how much we're doing having an effect? So it encourages us to do even more for the Lord. Isn't God a God of numbers? And he kept track of numbers as well. He has a book called Numbers Even. But you see, that's the importance of confessing publicly. You see, is that right here, the word of God mightily prevailed because people confessed and publicly showed their repentance before men because they burned up by burning up their sinful stuff. But people could have never known or saw God's power and might if Christians didn't confess in front of them. You see that right there at verses uh, 17 through 20? They wouldn't have seen that. They wouldn't have seen that. Also, one must understand that Christians who confess, they tend to get more things 
uh, done for God than for Christians who are private. Now, before you might say, oh, really, why do you say so? You got to understand this. If one withholds his spirit from outwardly confessing, it's no wonder he also withholds the spirit from outwardly working for the Lord in many other things. See, just be, this one time thing is, if you, if you don't understand that, I'll tell you this. I know that back at my home church and in this church, I notice that people who tend to get more things done for the Lord, get more outwardly, outwardly working, outwardly involved, is those who get on the altar and get right with God. I notice that from past experience. Of course, there are some people who are private and they do as much many things done for the Lord too. I see that too. But you know what the tendency I see is? The tendency is that people who actually get on the altar, outwardly get things right with God, they do more things outwardly for the Lord. I notice that. And if you don't think so, then I think you should check your life and you should check other people in the church of who comes down on the altar and how much they're probably doing things for the Lord. That might be something. Now, I want you all to understand this. That's why I never preached this sermon till now. Because I want you to get ready for the blowout. It would be a, it would be a, it would be a negative thing that our church, our home church, who opens up the revival meeting, has most of the people who don't go on the altar, whereas the visitors and the newcomers who are not even a part of this church go on the altar. So I want to preach this and let you understand this: is that I'm not criticizing anyone who doesn't come down on the altar. I realize how much of a thing, a private thing that is, and how much uncomfortable that brings to people. Sometimes people have good reasons for not coming down. But the reason why I'm preaching you this sermon is to realize the importance here. Because so, perhaps a lot of you never realized the importance of altar calls before until now. So I want you to understand how important and serious altar call is. See. Throughout history, ever since the beginning of Paul's time, and even to today, the Great Awakening revivals and Bible-believing churches around us, altar calls throughout history have always been a special place for salvation, people getting saved. For people who had a certain need and they asked God for a need to help them with. For a help that they needed help with. A repentance that they had and a surrender to the Lord. If you don't feel like coming down on the altar and receiving such a blessing, I just want to ask you this one question, okay? Because I know everyone has good reasons. And me, I don't judge people who comes down or uh, who comes on the altar or who doesn't come on the altar. I don't do that because I know that people have good reasons. But I would like to ask you this question, though. If you're not going to come down on the altar, then when will you ever come down on the altar? When? Because uh, I want you to think about this. Probably your most likely answer you never thought before was, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to come on the altar. I just never thought of it that way before. Well, I'm going to tell you something right here is that you will bow one day. You're going to publicly confess one day in front of God Almighty up in heaven. We're all going to do it. It doesn't matter what kind of character, culture, age, or sex you are. All of us will do that one day, including the hardest atheist. He will do that one day. Isn't it a sad thing that you never do it on this earth all this time where God gives you an opportunity, but you only do it up in heaven face to face with him? Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. If you don't come down, don't worry. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to judge you. But if the Lord spoke it upon your heart, I encourage you to come on the altar. It's the only time and opportunity where you fall prostrate before the Lord and you say, here I am, just as I am without one plea. And this is your chance and your only golden opportunity to lay it before the Lord. The service is nearing an end. The choir singing just as I am. And now as the old song is playing, people at the altar are kneeling down to pray. Some are finding mercy, forgiveness for their sin. 
Some are fighting battles, they're struggling to win. The time has come to give in to the Lord. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. <laughs> That's what this altar is for. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. There's a light in the darkness. There's a love that's true. And Jesus is waiting, child. He's waiting here for you. Go quickly now before they close the door. You can give your burdens to the Lord. That's what this altar is for. I see a father. He's praying with his son. A mother kneels beside them, thanking God they've come. And there's an old man standing there in tears, giving up a part of him he's held back for years. Hearts are being broken, lives are being changed. Those who call on Jesus, oh, they'll never be the same. The time has come to give in to the Lord. You don't have to hold those burdens anymore. That's what this altar is for. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. There's a light in the darkness. There's a love that's true. And Jesus is waiting, child. He's waiting here for you. Go quickly now before they close the door. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. That's what this altar is for. Let me sing it one more time as we close. We'll close it as I sing this one more time. That's what this altar is for. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. There's a light in the darkness. There's a love that's true. And Jesus is waiting, child. He's waiting here for you. Go quickly now before they close the door. You don't have to carry those burdens anymore. My friend, that's what Peter Cartwright, D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, David Peacock, Peter Ruckman, Brian Donovan, Song Lee, and that's what San Jose Bible Baptist Church realizes. That's what this altar is for. Let's all bow with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for people's hearts who soften to the preaching of your word. I wish we could spend a little more time a little longer, Lord, at this altar, but uh, time is short, and I want to respect the time for the people here, especially those who are new, Lord. We want, to, we want to make them feel as comfortable as possible in our church. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this altar call has been a blessed opportunity and eye-opening sermon. And as the blowout occurs and happens, I pray that uh, a lot of us uh, will be soft-hearted and will enjoy the meeting, will enjoy the service, and that will give you the glory and the honor that you deserve. I want to thank you so much, Lord, for the 